welcome back to another episode of Azure Mythbusters. And in this session, we're going to be talking about the various Azure compute services and whether you can use any Azure compute service to solve any problem. Will. Yep, so I guess to give some background behind that, the, the myth that we're going to really try and bust here is a lot of people will just take a peg and try and put you know, that round peg and put it in a square hole take whatever code they've got and try and cram it into whatever service they happen to like at the time. So we're going to try and debunk that a little bit, that there are specialised services on Azure. There are some generic ones, to be fair, and we'll talk about those as well. But we're going to talk about some of the more specialised compute services and what are the things you need to consider, what are the things that you need to think about when you try and use each type of service. Okay. So should we take a quick blast through which ones we've got, which kind of key services exactly. we have? So let's think. So what are the key compute services? Now, we're not going to go through every single Azure service because yeah. we'd be a lot longer than we can with this video, but um, we can look at the, really the main ones that we see come up in our day to day. Yeah. So here they are. Um, you can see there's, again, there's a lot of them. There's kind of a, a service for every, uh, every day and every type of activity that you might want to do. And you can roughly classify these into as we've seen on a number of prior sessions, IaaS, PaaS, Software as a Service, Serverless. Mm. Some of them fit in both categories. Mm. Yeah, and we're going to talk through some of those and say why you might choose to use one of the ones which is in each category over another. Um, but we'll take it from the top, shall we? Because we haven't got long. Absolutely. And should we start with App Service? Let's do that. So I think the thing about App Service is really where we see it being used as things like these web applications, these APIs, and there's also a containers option as well. Uh, and really, it's this multi-tenanted platform. So you've got the ability to scale without some of that overhead with the management side. If you're looking to have a fully managed um, hosting platform for hosting web and mobile applications, App Service is the place to go. Right? That's where you want. It's, I just want to deploy my code. I just want it to run. And I don't want to have the hassle of, of managing things, patching things, choosing numbers of instances, scaling it. Mm. It's literally, you drag a slider to auto scale. That's it. Now, I guess where there may be some confusion is there's another service called App Service Environment. Yeah. So one of the things on the prior slide, uh, which we didn't necessarily call out there, is that Azure App Service is, by definition, multi-tenanted. So you've got private workers, but the front ends are public and they're shared. So App Service Environment is where you want, I want all the benefits of App Service. I want it to be managed for me. I want it to be deployed for me and managed that way but I want it deployed in a private context. So I want my own instance of App Service. And I think some of the common scenarios where we've probably seen that used is where there are some compliance regulations or uh, various rules they need to follow. So the one I've seen is um, PCI compliance, for example. All your traffic needs to be uh, very securely held in your own network boundaries that you control. So that's maybe where you do something like this. Oh, there's a real key piece up here. One, you can remove the public IP. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you can actually have a private instance of App Service if you want to inside your own virtual network. And again, very much the web applications, the APIs, those typical web-based workloads is what we'd think for those. Yeah, absolutely. So should we go on to container instances? Mm, let's do that. So you know, containers is one of those areas that is really hotting up. We've got things like the Kubernetes service, which we'll come on to in a moment. Uh, we've got Service Fabric, which can host it yeah. as well. We just mentioned App Service, yeah. container instances. Yeah. So the one thing I really like about container instances, and it kind of typically shows its model, is I want to spin up a container instance quickly, and I don't need all the overhead of Kubernetes or Service Fabric. I don't want to orchestrate mm. millions or even thousands of containers. I want one or 10 sure. yeah, to, to handle a specific task and a specific target. The characteristics, they are effectively Docker containers. right? Whatever you're going to run, it's just that the infrastructure literally says, go get that, run it there, and that's it. And I think that's an interesting point, though, just to really make sure the point is driven home, is that container instances are designed to be simple. So with things like Kubernetes, you get all of this great benefit of if you decide to scale up to a number of instances, you change a configuration parameter, and off it goes. Kubernetes deals with that. Similarly, uh, if, you need, if the pod dies, for example, in Kubernetes terms, if the container dies, then Kubernetes will realize that and uh, start things up for you. But with container instances, um, it's more of that basic running a container model there. Yeah, totally. And speaking of Kubernetes. Let's move on to it. So Azure Kubernetes services, um, the difference really between the container insight side is that you do have this uh, management layer of Kubernetes over the top. And 
naturally, you know, what we're seeing in the industry is a trend moving towards this. Um, what I'd say is making sure that people know the investment they're making when they go into Kubernetes, because Kubernetes is one piece, but it really is a platform for an infrastructure platform. So you still have to think about things like the networking and all of those rules that you'd typically think about from an infrastructure play as well. Yeah, and that shows within the, you know, within the SLA types that we've got down towards the bottom, doesn't it? You, you say the, the SLA of the instances that you're running Kubernetes are dependent on the infrastructure configuration that you choose to put it on. Absolutely. We'll still manage it for you mm -hmm. with, with um, Azure Kubernetes service. It's not like building out your own Kubernetes cluster. We'll build it for you, we'll manage it for you. But you still have to make some intelligent choices about where you want to host things, which services you want to host them on, uh, network configuration, etc. Yep. And for anyone who's never done it, uh, you'll realize if you try and go make a Kubernetes cluster on your own, there is a lot of overhead taken away by using this kind of approach. So, you know, it, it abstracts some of that away, but things like it deploying into a virtual network, there are still things that you have to think about uh, in terms of that configuration. Yep. Which moves us on, I suppose, to another orchestrator of sorts, which is Azure Service Fabric. Yeah, so our native microservices platform um, underpins the majority of Azure, frankly. Um, Azure Service Fabric can, you know, just moving on from the container types, it can orchestrate containers, and it does a pretty good job of orchestrating containers, but it can do far, far more than that. It is a native, you know, hyperscale microservices platform with its own SDK. Mm -hmm. One area where it is noticeably different from pretty much every other uh, container orchestrator SaaS platform on the market is it's designed to handle stateful services. Right. Yeah, so you know, bring bring your data and put it in Service Fabric. Whereas most other container orchestrator platforms or the microservices platforms say, no, no, just bring the code, mm. put the code in a container, bring it to us, and put the state somewhere else. Yep. So store it in a database, store it somewhere else. But we actually natively within Service Fabric will will quite happily run mm. stateful. Um, services where we will make that state highly available and distributed and partitioned. Gotcha. Um, in fact, I think it is actually one of the only services that we natively do that in, mm. um, or at least that we would advocate people put mm. state inside the service. And I think we've done that with a lot of services as well. When you look at some of the examples online, you'll see a lot of Azure services or other Microsoft services, even some of the games actually go ahead and uh, leverage service fabric under the covers for that. So where you've got um, services that require uber low latency, mm. yeah, so you need that state to be co-located on the same instance as the code, mm. this is perfect. And that's an interesting point. When you think about all the things we've talked about so far, typically the state has been externalized. And we've spoken before about how latency is one of those requirements and sensitivity to latency. So that's a really interesting driving factor for service fabric. Yeah, I, well, we talked in the last episode of kind of from the old to the new and similar patterns. Mm. But one of the things that comes into here is that idea of co-located state mm. in a very similar way you'd expect a mainframe service to work, sure. but applied to modern microservices architecture. Mm. Azure Batch. Yeah, so when you've got really, 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 really big workloads yeah. that you actually, you know, you can't run necessarily, or you could run in containers, but you don't necessarily have them orchestrated that way. Mm -hmm. Things like Monte Carlo simulations, big scheduled jobs that you typically run overnight, big HPC workloads. Mm -hmm. um, Azure Batch is kind of simply a batch orchestrator. Right. Yeah, job, big, big iron job scheduler, mm -hmm. thousands of VMs in a group. Yeah, I want to distribute that work across those and I want it all completely managed for me. Gotcha. So a managed scheduling service. Exactly. I mean, it's a bit more than that behind the scenes in terms of that the front end's multi-tenant APIs and the way in which it runs and, and actually pushes state around for you. Mm. So whereas we think of, of state in terms of a microservice as being, um, you know, it, it's like a pipeline. Mm. Yeah, so I've got something here, I push it into the service, I change something here and it, it sits there. Understood. Yeah, with batch, it comes out the other end. Understood, so yeah. pipeline. Yeah, exactly. I think this is one which is certainly uh, a hot topic of the month, isn't it? Is Azure Functions and the whole sphere of serverless at the moment. Yeah, this is one of my favorite services, to be honest, Functions. It's just so versatile for what you choose to do. Um, and the price model for it is substantially different. It's got a barrier of entry of, of nothing. Yep. Yeah, it starts for free. Yep. So, um, but the way in which you have to build stuff for Functions is very subtly different right. from, from other services. So, you know, it, literally the entry point is, as we say, it's a function. Mm. Yep, so it's a fragment of code, mm -hmm. uh, a Pico service, if you will, or a nano service. 
um, and then combining those together, you would effectively end up with something like a web API or a microservice. Mm. Um, again, kind of advocate stateless yep. to start with. Yep. Um, there is durable functions and durable tasks, which begins to, to look at orchestration and management of state within functions. Mm. So although we're still externalizing that state to an additional service externally, what we're actually doing is we're bringing the management of that state in which is subtly different from most of the other services. Gotcha, but the key thing there is that function-based development approach, isn't it? So, and I yeah. think there's another service which we'll move on to actually, which is Logic Apps. Yeah. And that is also serverless, but rather than functions, it's more workflow-based, right? Yeah, it, its native node is, is basically serverless. Mm. You, you are charged per, or per step, actually, I believe you get charged. Right. rather than necessarily per execution. So mm -hmm. there's an invocation, there's an invocation of the different stages. Yeah. But it's a, there's a graphical workflow designer behind this, so it's almost code free. Gotcha. So it could be quite nice then, even if you didn't use it in the longer term, just for POCing out some kind of approach, some kind of workflow, and then uh, proving out that something works. And then could potentially find that actually it's something that works longer term and then you adopt it as part of that process. Yeah, absolutely. And I've seen a lot of people actually, we've worked with customers that do exactly that. Mm -hmm. They'll go, okay, how, how can we get from, from, you know, from zero to 50 miles an hour really, really, really quickly? Yep. How can we get from that point and, and take off? And Logic Apps is great for prototyping and for accelerating development. Mm -hmm. And then actually we've got there, they think, well, actually this is pretty good. It's handling retry for me. It's all natively handling high availability. It scales massively. Yeah, so there's even a high throughput mode gotcha. if the standard scale isn't enough. Gotcha. Um, and that's like up, up to 100,000 parallel invocations. Um, and that would, that would just simply go, well, why would we change that? That's working perfectly. And I guess we can't end this session without talking about some of our beloved uh, virtual machines either. Oh, yeah. You know, that idea of having our pets that we go and care for. And yeah. uh, we could have them stateless, we could have them stateful as well, depending on the implementation. But I think the key thing to compare virtual machines with, uh, which we'll talk about in a moment, is scale sets. Now, virtual machines themselves, to actually scale that workload, you have to go and add extra virtual machines themselves, right? Yeah, so absolutely. there is that management overhead there. Yeah, I, I, I talk to people who do actually do stuff like that with automation. They'll spin up and shut down sure, machines. Sure, sure. But the key thing is if you want that level of elasticity, you have to write it if you're using virtual machines. You have to have some scripting libraries behind it, and you have to do this stuff for yourself. Mm. The key thing for me about VMs as a, as a kind of workload host is they're incredibly versatile. Yeah, you, you, can, you can put more or less any workload you like into them, and it will run more or less unchanged. Yeah, sometimes there's subtle tweaks, but there's very little you have to change. And they're ideal for a straight lift and shift. Mm -hmm. If you've got a legacy workload that you've got something that means it won't run somewhere else or it can't be re-architected, then virtual machines are your fallback plan option. And that's probably a good point for us to move on to scale sets and yeah. compare and contrast. So, um, I guess the idea is the pets versus cattle. The virtual machines were the pets where you look after them, you love them, you care for them. But the cattle side of things with virtual machine scale sets is that all of those machines are managed as one object. So you don't care which objects are serving, what they're doing, you know, really the nuts and bolts of how they're configured and managed. It's a set and they just need to go and do their job. Yeah, absolutely. You have to think about them in a manner of them being disposable. Mm. Yeah, you, you, you can't put something onto one machine that you expect to be there mm. it, when it gets rebooted or recreated uh, because that machine could be pulled down and disposed of and scaled in and scaled, scaled back out later on. So they're non-stateless. They have to be non-stateful workloads. Yes. And that's an interesting point that you mentioned about the scale in, scale out. The fact that with the scale set, it's literally just a slider or an auto scale rule rather than having to manually go and add each of those virtual machines like you did with virtual machines. So. Um, you know, again, another difference there. Yeah. So should we summarize quickly the different scenarios that we've got? Exactly, yeah. so you've got to think about what your requirements are uh, when you go with all of these, and ultimately think about the future-proofing side of things as well. Don't get drawn into the fact that something's new and shiny and it will go and immediately solve the problem. You need to look at the characteristics of the workload as a whole and uh, identify that. Yeah, yeah, exactly, and I guess the final upshot of it is that once you're clear on the problem that you're trying to actually resolve mm. in Azure, so am I going for a stateful workload? Mm. Am I just trying to lift and shift something? Am I trying to kind of lift and shift something, but I want to actually add more elasticity to save some costs? There are options in Azure for every single one of those types of scenarios, for stateless, stateful, functions, you know, containers, uh, elasticity, 
and static workloads. But you really have to think about what problem you're trying to solve first, and then there is definitely an Azure option for you. So we've spoken through the various compute options that we've got in Azure, through uh, to Azure Kubernetes service, all the way from things like Service Fabric to our beloved virtual machines as well. And I think what we've identified along the way is how important things are like requirements and understanding the problem that you're trying to solve, because each of those various compute options are going to have a different set of characteristics that you can go ahead, map to them, and make the right choice. So there we go. We've gone through and spoken about those compute options, and I think we've well and truly busted the myth that you can choose any compute option for your needs as part of your solution.